brothers and sisters in Islam living in the West is fun compared with life out there where we come from. We have a lot of opportunities. If you're a hardworking individual, you certainly can make a good living here. But there is always one thing that bothers us day in and day out is our children. Because we came, and I'm sorry I'm addressing immigrants. My khutbah will be all-inclusive in a minute. Because we came with something. Our parents delivered something to us. Still hold us. But our children here, if they are gone, they are gone. And something interesting too that even if one of your offspring, one of the cycles gets off track, possibly the offspring of that cycle could come back to the deen. But over here, if you miss one cycle, meaning if your child gets off, that means it's done. The children of that, your grandchildren are done too. How many times you come across someone whose name is Ahmed, Ismail, Muhammad, and you talk to them and he's not really Ahmed, he's not Ismail, he's Muhammad. He's really a John, a, a Jackson. I'll never forget this day when one of, I went to a restaurant to eat and this Mexican brother, I'm calling him brother because he, alhamdulillah, he accepted Islam. I went to the restaurant looking like this and the moment that he saw me, he said, my grandfather looked exactly like you. Who are you? I am so and so. And what religion are you? I'm a Catholic. And my grandparents used to live in Spain. And then they migrated to uh, Mexico and I became a Catholic. But I remember my grandfather used to look like you. Who are you? Our children is what worries us here. A lot of children are lost, brothers and sisters in Islam. And if you think in the day of resurrection, this will pass, you're mistaken. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fi ma akhraja al-Bukhari wa Muslim, min hadith Abdullah ibn Umar, radiyallahu anhuma, kullukum ra'a. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ All of you are shepherds, custodians. And in the day of resurrection, you will be asked about your custody. وفي حديث معقل بن يسار عند مسلم قال صلى الله عليه وسلم The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم says ما من عبد يسترعيه الله رعية ثم يموت يوم يموت وهو غاش لها إلا وحرمه الله على الجنة Any servant of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Allah سبحانه وتعالى places under his responsibility under his custody something and he would betray that, that person is haram to enter Jannah. Because 
the children are a grant from Allah to us. لِلَّهِ مُلْكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَخْلُقُ مَا يَشَاءُ يَهَبْ You know the, 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 the verb grant or the word grant that you get something without doing anything. You will a government grant, just you don't have to do anything. You go and you fulfill your sexual desire and you end up with a child. You don't do really nothing, grant. Brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places between our hands a Muslim child. When the child is born, is born a Muslim. And now you come in as a parent and your responsibility is to maintain that. Is to keep that. قال صلى الله عليه وسلم كل مولود يولد على الفطرة وفي لفظ على الإسلام every newborn is born a Muslim. So when that baby comes out of the womb crying, he's a Muslim. She's a Muslim baby. Then what happened, Ya Rasulullah, صلى الله عليه وسلم فأبوا then the two parents make the change. Yuhawidani, yunassirani, yumajjisani. It's a responsibility that we must, as responsible people, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bring our children up as Muslims. And I'm telling you, it's becoming harder and harder and harder and harder every day. Not just in the non-Muslim community. I'm talking about the majority. Even in Muslim communities, Muslim countries. It's becoming, because, you know, the, you're walking, you're traveling, you're swimming against the current. Everybody is going this way and you're trying to go the opposite way. It's becoming hard. Brothers and sisters in Islam, when we talk about bringing up Muslim children, our Muslim children, we have one goal. The goal is to give them al akhirah They compare between the objective of tarbiyah with non-Muslims and the objective of tarbiyah with Muslims. Here is what tarbiyah, and if you're not aware of the word tarbiyah, tarbiyah means upbringing, you bring in, nourishing, raising. Tarbiyah with non-Muslims the key, just make sure that your child is happy. Regardless, he could go same sex. I'm hinting to something here. Hopefully you're getting it. He can smoke. He can drink. She can have girlfriend, uh, boyfriends. She doesn't have to wear hijab. She just has to feel comfortable. She needs to find harmony. Otherwise, I'm going to take her to the psychotherapist and bring her the pressing pills. And Islam is totally different. The objective of tarbiyah, of raising children in Islam, around one verse. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ 
عليها ملائكة غلاظ شداد لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون Oh, you believe protect yourselves safeguard yourselves and your family from the hellfire and then the description of that so the objective you when you bring up your child your goal is to help him to get the akhirah not just this dunya not just this world Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu an explained protect your children from the hellfire and yourselves from the hellfire he said allimuhum ad-din teach them the religion bring them up with the religion so you're living in a muslim majority non-muslims yani, environment they are raising their children but their goal their objective is really here this world you're a muslim you're raising your child your goal is beyond here so we do have two different goals now different objectives means you're going to have to seek different means. You cannot bring up your child like your neighbor. You can't. You have to have the means that can help you bring your child as a Muslim. Brothers and sisters in Islam, a study, they tell you to bring up a Muslim child but again I want to tell you something by the will of Allah at the end of the day by the leave of Allah we're talking about the, uh, the, the average but sometimes a listen Musa Nabiullah alayhi salatu was salam was brought up by the field and you know who Musa is Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, one of his sons disbelieved. Hey, Adam has two sons, one of them killed the other. For, we're not talking about at the end of the day is the leave, the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you and me, all what we have in our hands is seeking the means trying to do something about it ya rab this is what i'm going to do and i'm hoping ya rab this will work but if it doesn't work at least you did it you know when you neglect your child 100 percent you never teach them the deen you're negligent of their raising of them being raised up as muslims and they go astray i'm sorry you're part of the problem you contributed to it. But if you tried, khalas, I did my part. But I tell you, three institutions that you need. And listen, if you miss one of these components, it's not going to work. It's not going to work in order to produce Muslim children, especially here. Number one, the Muslim family, the home. Number two, the masjid. Number three, the school and the social aspects of the school. And I mean by a school, even college, we're talking about college. If you can nourish these children until college, ideal. But at least through the years, the crucial years of teenaging, you have to. 
The theme that we have for my lectures this weekend is empowering the Muslim family. Because that is where a lot of the problems really begin. Having this functional home where the children are not receiving the initial teachings of the religion. That is why, brothers and sisters in Islam, the Sharia, the religion, told you how to put that Muslim home together. Imagine this. Qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, addressing the men who are seeking marriage. Tunkahu al-mar'atu li arba' A woman in, is asked in marriage because of four incentives, four reasons. Four reasons that motivate you. Four incentives to seek a woman in marriage. Number one, her physical beauty. Jamaliha. She has a figure. Two, Maliha. Her wealth, her education. She will bring money into the family. She will pay the bills. Three, her lineage. Mostly lineage now means she will give you a green card or something. Then the religion. Which one should I choose, O Messenger of Allah? Which one? فَغْفَرْ بِذَاتِ الدِّينِ تَرِبَتْ يَدَاكِ the Prophet وسلم, did not say marry the one with the religion. He said, win. Win the one who has the religion. That shows you one, one thing, that they are not available. Not too many of them are available. And it's true. For you now to find a righteous, pious woman is like pearls in the depth of an ocean. And that shows you also that how a lot of our sisters who are interested in attracting good potential husbands, they're going about it the wrong way. They think that they have to take off the hijab and they have to uh, put the white and, and the yellow on their faces and they have to, wear, uh, to, to, to show their qualities body-wise yeah, in order to attract prospective husbands. Shows you confusion. Fadfar bidat al deen. Brothers, sisters in Islam, listen, if you can find a beautiful woman with money, with lineage, with the deen, go ahead. If you can find the four, go ahead. But you compromising the religion for the others, no. Why? Because that decision you're making is not just for you. Or the consequences of that decision is not only on you. Before you're choosing a wife, you're choosing a mother for your children. This woman will bring up your children. Abu al-Aswad al-Du'ali, wada ilm al He called upon his children one day and he said this to them. I was good to you before your birth and after your birth. They said, how? How before our birth? We know after your birth, we know who you are and how you treated us as a father, but how did you do it before our birth? He said, I chose a mother for you, you should be proud of. I didn't just choose any. Al-Ummiya Ikhwa is like earth. ورد هذا في آية الحج يا أيها الناس إن كنتم في ريب من البعث فإنا خلقناكم look at the end of the verse وترى الأرض هامدة so it's like if you want to really plant a nice tree you choose the best land the best piece of earth fertile good
What about the sisters? Is the decision just yours? No, the sisters, the Sharia also addressed them. كما عند الترمذي قال صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا جاءكم من ترضون خلقه ودينه فزوجوه إلا تفعلوا تكن فتنة في الأرض وفساد كبير واللفظ الآخر عريض If someone comes to you proposing to marry your daughter, your sister, whoever is under your guardianship, you better give your daughters in marriage that with, to that person, provided that you're pleased with two things, their character and their deen. Look right now how parents choose husbands for their daughters. Oh, he's an engineer, but he drinks. Oh, it's, it's okay, he will give it up. He has girlfriends. Oh, he's a successful doctor. He, he will be okay, be okay. You're exposing your daughters to fitna. Big time. <coughs> Normally, the, the man is the one who should really propose and request the women in marriage. Sometimes actually to fulfill this, to make this happen, you could break the norm. You could actually break the custom that you can propose to a man to marry your daughter. If you know that he is righteous and pious. قالت إحداهما يا أبت استأجر إن خير من استأجرت القوي الأمين قال إني أريد أن أنكحك إحدى ابنتي هاتين. The righteous man of Madian he offered Musa his two daughters. But Musa don't go to somebody out there in the street. لا. Musa, Nabiullah, you could do that. ولما تأيمت حفصة كما عند البخاري من عبد الله السهمي أو ابن خنيس السهمي. Imagine Omar. You know who Omar is? Omar went to Uthman ibn Affan. Would you like to marry my daughter حفصة? He went to Abu Bakr. Would you like to marry my daughter Hafsa? And at the end, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa married her. So I'm just trying to bring a point that to make sure that your daughter is going to end up in the hands of a righteous, pious man, you could break the norm. But be careful. Don't do this with a foolish person. Don't belittle yourself, nor belittle your family, nor belittle your daughter. Make sure that you do this with someone you trust. He has a deen. He fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why, ya ikhwa? Yani, Su'il al Hassan al Basri, rahimahullah, one of the predecessors of this ummah, he said, Listen, I'm having two candidates, two marriage proposals. Which one should I choose? He said, give her to the righteous. Give her to the pious. Why? If he loves her, فَإِنَّهُ إِنْ أَحَبَّهَا أَكْرَمَهَا If he loves her, he will honor her. He will dignify her. وَإِذَا كَرِهَهَا لَنْ يَظْلِمْهَا and if he dislikes her, he will never oppress her. Then taqi deals with Allah. لا يظلمها. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm talking this in context of the first component to bring up the children. Again, dear sisters, before you choosing a husband for yourself, you choosing also a father for your children. That is why you should bring in someone who can teach your children the religion. Become a role model for the children. Add to this, brothers and sisters in Islam, marriage is a testy process. You know, <laughs> I still remember these days when we were brought up, they used to show up, show us these soap operas. 
you know, 30 episodes normally to match Ramadan. That two people are, a man and a woman are in love and every episode he's trying to marry her and then some odd person, Azul, comes in and delays the process. And then the next episode, another thing. Here's the interesting piece. The 30th episode, they tell you, they got married and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> You're dreaming. There is a part two. They never show you part two. They never show you part two. Marriage? The head of disbelief in earth every single day crowns a jinni who separates a husband and wife. And I'm taking this from Hadith Jabir. Ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhuma and the Muslim. Indeed, shaitan places his throne in water every single day in the morning. And he would say to the jinn, the helpers from the, the jinn, Man adalla al-yawma musliman al taj. Whoever does the best job today in misguiding Muslims, I will place the crown on your head with my own hands. I'll crown you. Go. At night, he places the throne again on water. And these jinni would come reporting their accomplishments for the day. They would stand, I was able to get this, someone to kill this one. This one, I got him, I whispered to him until he committed adultery. This one, I whispered to him until he uh, backbit this person. Until this one stands, I did not separate a husband and wife. I did not leave a husband and wife until I separated them. I was able to separate the husband and wife. Ni'ma ant. You're my man. You come out. You are the one to be crowned. Subhanallah, we have a, a verse in the Quran called the verse of sorcery. Surah Al-Baqarah. La tawila. Wattaba'u ma tatlu al-shayateen wa ala mulku Sulaiman. Look, subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala singled out the most damaging thing that sorcery can do in the community. What? With sorcery, you can damage. You can do a lot of damages. But this is the most damaging thing that can be done. That you use magic, witchcraft, black magic, sorcery to separate a husband and wife from one another. The Muslim home. And if you join us, inshallah, this weekend with the lectures, we're going to have almost three lectures, ta'ala, talking about how can we empower the Muslim home. So again, to bring up to do tarbiyah, to raise Muslim children, the first place you need to set up is your home, brothers and sisters in Islam. But before I, I go to the second component quickly, some of us may say, Tab Sheikh, yani we, when I got married, I didn't know all that stuff that you're telling me. And it's true. I'm telling you 75 to 80% of the marriages in the Muslim world never founded on the basis of religion. Ask, ask a Muslim now, why did you marry your wife? Oh man, she was so beautiful. She was, that's why. Oh, my mom wanted me to marry her. Never the religion has been a factor, never. Now I'm asking you to go and divorce your wives and then try again. Is that what I'm asking? I hope that's not what you're getting. No. Fix yourself. There is always a way. Start with yourself. Start with yourself. Why don't you reform? You come back to the deen first. You take the initiative. And then they will come. In a way. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم
الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم The Masjid There is a notion out there in the minds of a lot of the Muslims, especially the elders, that children should not be in the masjid. Is they mess up, they break things, and they make noise, and they run around. And I'm telling you, this is the biggest mistake you make as a community, you make as a family. Where are the children going to be then if they are not in the masjid? How would you then understand that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would pray carrying his granddaughter Umama on his hand? And when he prostrates, he would place her in the ground. How would you understand that one day he was delivering a sermon, khutbah like this, Al Hassan wal Hussein walked in. He actually went down and picked them up. How would you understand the text that when he leads the salah and when he hears the crying of a child? Isn't that an indication that children can be in the masjid? We're not doing bid'ah here, okay? We're <laughs> but at the same time, brothers and sisters in Islam, you as a parent, to listen the impact of your children in the masjid, you should teach them the etiquettes and the, ma the manners of being in the masjid. You see, uh, it takes two things here. The issue has two ends. The truth right in the middle. Yes, children should be in the masjid. But now it is the responsibility of the parent to guard the children in the masjid, to teach them the etiquettes of the masjid. You should not bring your child runs around in front of the people disturbing them. La, have your child next to you. Teach them how to respect the masjid. Teach them how to deal with the house of Allah, that you should not treat the house of Allah like you treat any other place. But the masjid must be part of your child. Part. I love it when I see a parent bringing his child to the salah with him. Your child will never forget this. Will never forget it. Especially if the message that is, the masjid is delivering is Quran and Sunnah, Deen, proper aqeedah, proper beliefs. Important. The second component, brothers and sisters, in Islam is the masjid. The third one is the school. Having a school. I cannot imagine children going to public schools. How can they make it? It's impossible. Everything is being taught in the public school system is no religion. So you would be teaching religion at home, the masjid, and you, they go to the public school, no religion. You know, America is founded on separation of church and state that that's how they run the country we're not going to interfere with that we're a minority there is nothing we can do about it we have if you if you choose to but you're really exposing your child to big 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 fitna look at it. sex education in the public schools it's a mark of shame for a, a, a young man who's at the verge of teenaging if he hasn't smoked a joint yet. That's the culture. I don't know if your brothers are not aware of, of this or not, but if, if you're not aware of this, then I'm telling you this is the reality. Out there, that, that means you're 10 or 11 years old. Oh, you haven't smoked a joint yet? Shame on you. You're not a man. Oh, you don't have a boyfriend? 
Man, you're 15 years old and you don't have a boyfriend? Oh, that means you're not beautiful. You're still virgin? That means men are not interested in you. And on and on and on and on and on. I can sit here and... For the solution is schools like El Minhal, where your children are here. The least brothers and sisters in Islam that if they end up doing something wrong, they will find someone who tells them, no, stop. This is haram. I don't want to prolong this because of your work. But in general, I'm telling you, brothers and sisters in Islam, if you do not take care of your children, you're a loser in this world. You're a loser in the grave. You're a loser in the hereafter. What do you mean? Subhanallah, if you read all the verses in the Quran commanding the children to be dutiful to the parents, they come immediately after recognizing Tawheed. What do I mean? وَاعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَلَا تُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَلَّا تَعْبُدُوا إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Always. Now who's going to teach the children Tawheed? Who will? If you don't do that, that means when you grow old, they're going to throw you in a senior home. They're not going to be dutiful to you. When you're sick, oh, he's sick. So, so you're a loser. You spend a lot of time with them, spend a lot of your resources on them, and when you need them at old age, they are not there because you have not delivered the first one. In the grave, قال صلى الله عليه وسلم, the hadith that you all memorize, إذا مات الإنسان, لفظ الآخر ابن آدم, when the son of Adam dies, he stops receiving good deeds. What is the first one? Walad. Just walad? لا. Walad salih. Righteous offspring. Righteous. Walad here does not mean a boy. Means offspring. Righteous offspring who will invoke the mercy of Allah upon you. So here you are in the grave, alone, in the grave. Your son can make dua for you to help you. But with one condition, salih. Now, did you contribute to his righteousness and piety before your death? Did you? You will harvest that. In the day of resurrection, subhanallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warad fil Bukhari that he will show a man, a mountain of deeds, a mountain of good deeds. He will say, Ya Rab, I did not do this. Your son did this for you. Your daughter did this for you. Hatta fil Jannah, and I close, inshaAllah. We know that ranks in Jannah are many. Some of the scholars said 100. You know Jannah is 100 levels. 100 levels, imagine this. Based on your deeds, you may end up to be in the first level, second level, third level, but there is the 100. Some scholars actually said more than that, more than 100, based on the text here. Shuf. amanu. Look at that verse in Surah At-Tur. amanu. Those who believed and died as believers. وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ بِإِيمَانِ their children were believers after them and they died as believers. So the parents were believers, died as believers. The children were believers, died as believers. What if there is a mismatch regarding the level in Jannah? That you are to be in, in the 50 level, for example, and your 
son is in the hundred. Now one of the bounties of Jannah that you're going to be with your family. One of the good things about Jannah that who's going to join who? Who's going to join who? So if you as a father qualify only to the 50th level and your son in the hundred, you will join your son in the hundred. والذين آمنوا واتبعتهم دريتهم بإيمان الحقنا بهم دريتهم وما ألتناهم من عملهم من شيء فنسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يصلح أبناءنا وأبناء المسلمين اللهم أصلح شبابنا وشباب المسلمين اللهم أصلح شبابنا وشباب المسلمين يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحمنا برحمتك اللهم احفظ أولادنا اللهم ردهم إلى دينهم ردا جميلا اللهم احفظهم بالإسلام قائمين وبالإسلام قاعدين يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعلهم هداة مهديهم اللهم اهدهم واهد بهم واجعلهم سببا لمن اهتدى يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا إسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم